So drowning in pshat is a phrase coined years ago to describe a frustrating Jewish intellectual phenomenon. The lack of willingness of those who learn Torah to dig deeper and develop a more profound understanding of history and current events. They are so preoccupied with mastering pshat that they literally drown in it. Someone, uh, Gadol, recently said that, uh, you know, it's got to the point that, that most Bochim, basically, they learn pshat, they learn chumash only through the Gemara. And the way people are, you know, emphasizing learning, you know, the, the Forshim, that it will, it will get to a point where basically people start learning the Gemara through the Briskarov. You know, it's, you know, it's just more emphasis on, the, on these things. What does this mean? First, <laughs> there's the word pshat. Pshat from the Hebrew word uh, pashut, which means simple, in Torah, it refers to the simplest and most basic explanation of an idea. It is the version of a concept that emerges when first exposed to it, before asking the question, what does this really mean? For as, as the Midrash points out, even the simplest of Torah ideas can be understood on many levels. As it says, the Midrash says, there are 70 facets of Torah, turn it around, and the round for everything is inside of it. And so to access those 70 facets explains the result, one must enter something called pardes. So he says in Shar HaGilgul, the following thing, there are four levels of Torah understanding, and the Rosh Tevas is pardes. Right, Rosh Tevas being the first letter of each of the four Hebrew words. Right, the Apshat, Rem is Drush, and Sod. This is a side point, the word pardes, uh, the Hebrew word pardes is the, is the basis of the English word paradise, because the first, the first paradise, in fact, was a pardes, and not just a, a pardes in a physical sense, but a pardes in this sense, that, that Adam Rishon, where he was living before the Chet, on the level of Atzilus, very high up, that it was much more of an intellectual reality. One of the questions they ask, or one of the discussions amongst the Mukubulim, is whether it's even permissible to actually teach Kabbalah, to verbalize, not just to, even to, to somebody else, but even to yourself. Because the moment you verbalize something, you draw it down, you bring it down to a lower level, because to express it in words means to express it on, on a lower level. That's why... Moshe Benu says to Kush Baruch Hu that I'm Oros Vasayim, I have uncircumcised lips, and Aaron HaKohen is the one who's, who's chosen to act as intermediary between him and, 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 and Paro. So the Mephoshim explained that uh, that meant because, because Moshe Benu saw things on such a high abstract level, he didn't want to profane it by bringing it down to the level of Paro. He could bring it to the level of Aaron HaKohen, who then he himself could take it to a lower level and transfer it to Paro. But he was talking on a much higher level. That's already a physical being. Adam Rishon was in the level of Kasanus Or with an Aleph, right? He was made from light. His whole, his whole reality was so incredibly high up that we, we can't even really conceive of it at this point in time. But once, again, see that Dechis Amesim, which the Gemara says that at that point in time, anybody who's gone through the, the process of resurrection will actually look like a Malach. So, you know, we're talking about a, a, a heavenly reality. Even though it was, so to speak, Earth, it was a physical world, that it was, it was a part of, let's say, compared to other high realities, but everything in my separation was on, on a much higher level. So the actual pardes that he lived in was not a pardes we'd have today, where you have apples growing in the fields and oranges and things like that. His pardes literally would have been intellectual reality. So that's why, as Elisham explains, when Hashem said to Adam Arishan, you know, Shamar the Avda, go and, and, and guard the garden and work the garden, he wasn't saying go to, you know, Home Depot and go pick yourself a, a hoe and start digging away and, you know, plant things already, make it look like a nice little garden over here. He was talking on the level of, of, uh, of what is Hashem in terms of uh, intellectually, you know, you know connecting to Kishboch on a much higher level. So it really was a pardes. The actual pardes in the beginning was the ultimate pardes. Today a pardes is different, but that's what it refers to. So pardes refers to Pshat, Ramaz, Drush, and Sod. That would have been the pardes of Anamarisha. Why, right. why, when Adam, when, 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 uh, when uh, uh, Harun spoke it out, why wasn't that conducive? Because uh, just the same with the, 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 the spheres yeah. filtered the light, right? Chachma, if the light of Chachma, or let's just start even higher up, Kesser went from, you know, you know Kesser to Chachma and didn't change, the next level would not be called Chachma, it would still be called Kesser. It's the same light, yeah. wherever that light would go. Why is it called Chachma? Because Chachma means the light on the way down somehow was, was reduced in, in its intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So the same way that the, the spheres act as intermediaries, and therefore they receive the light on one level, right? Chachma has to receive the light on the level of Kesser, so to speak, but filter it down for Bina and to, to a lower level. That's the level of Chachma. So Arna Cohen acted in the exact same way. He was a filter. He was able to receive the light. Moshe himself had to step it down somewhat for Arna Cohen. 
But when Aaron received it, so he was able to understand it on a level and then filter it down. The same way, for example, what we're doing right now is the exact same idea. Someone learns the Zohar. If he gave the Zohar over, over exactly the way it's written, you know, and doesn't bother to explain it, the audience would go, you know what? What is that supposed to mean? You know, you know, what are those ideas all about? So what does a person do? He learns the Zohar on the level that it's being written. He understands it, and then he, 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 he finds a way to describe it in terms of the audience can relate to. He's just filtered it. That's what Aaron did. Aaron received it, and he filtered it. And that's what, that's what education is all about. So he says, he goes on and says, a, a, a person needs to work hard in all of them to the best of his ability and find a teacher who can teach them to him. If he lacks one of these four levels relative to what he could have learned, then he will, he will have to reincarnate to compensate for what he is missing. So contrary to popular, popular belief, for many people, for example, who look at Kabbalah as being out in left field, I mean, you know, we'll see you know, at some point in time, we're, I don't know exactly where it shows up, but, but basically these correspond to the four levels of learning. Obviously, Pshat corresponds to Mikra. Mikra is, you know, you learn, you learn the Chumash. You learn a Pasuk from Chumash, a simple Pasuk, basically, you know, you're Chazim the Parsha, that's the level of Pshat. That's the level of, I mean, obviously Pshat applies to anything, also the Gemara. But the simplest Pshat, the, the system of learning, it's a simple pasuk from the Chumash. You know, it's not complicated. Then comes, then comes the, the level of Remes. That's the level of Mishnah, right? Mishnah works by Ramazu. It works by hints. It doesn't speak the whole thing out. It doesn't, it's not a, it doesn't elaborate on ideas. Even the language itself is very terse because it's been meant you know, for memories. It's, it's the oral law. So that's already on a deeper level. Then you have the level of, of Drush, which, of course, is the Gemara. The Gemara is constantly, you know, you know it's, it's constantly the process of Drush by being dorish and investigating and going deeper and deeper to try to come to the conclusion as to what this idea actually means, because we need to do that for the sake of, of deciding halacha, because it's, it's when you understand the, the actual kind, that's why the Gemara spent so much time you know, splitting hairs and, and even creating scenarios that seem to be way beyond what might happen in everyday life, but it does that specifically because only by, t- by, by pushing the envelope with an idea can you get to the essence of the concept. And once you have the essence, then you can apply it to everyday life, wherever it has to be applied. All the applications we have today of, uh, of halacha that are modern day scenarios based upon ancient halacha, meaning that it goes back to Torah, back to Sinai 3,000 years ago, has been made possible because of the fact that the Gemara took the time to explain the essence of the concept so that we can say, well, therefore, turning a light bulb is a function of, of ish, it's a function of fire. Turning a switch is a function of building. Then we can make those, draw those conclusions. So most people think that's where it stops. You know, Sod, Kabbalah, Who's it for, right? You know, from a kupali, what do they do? Who knows, right? Somehow they're very spiritual, esoteric people. But the, the rest of us learning, if I go my entire life only learning Gomorrah, or I go my entire life only learning Mishnah, right, and, and, and never make an effort to try to get to the level where I, I'm zoichet to see things like Sod, then, then, you know, so what? What's the big deal? So the Arizal say, don't even think like that. We'll see why later on, why even more. It's, it's so important how... It creates the, the, the shlemas of a person, how that you cannot become an Adam Shalin without this level. But more importantly, it's the reason why we're drowning in history, for the most part. And we don't understand what's going on, and we misperceive events and misperceive realities. And as a result of that, we misperceive the gula. And that's really the bottom line. Right? The bottom line is, is the gula is probably here, it's been here, there's been a potential for gula. Every single generation, opportunities come and go, some are more opportune than others. And very often, you know, there's also, there's also the Sidus Chinam. The lack of, of, of you know, coherency in the Jewish world today is based upon a lack of, of going to these, these deeper levels. But the reason I was telling you that if you, if you make, you can fool yourself all you want, but the bottom line is, if you don't want to come back another time unnecessarily, make a point of learning all these levels as much as possible, because if you don't, you'll have to reincarnate because it's considered to be a pagam. It's considered to be a chesaron, a lacking in a person not to have any of these levels if they are capable of getting to them. Mm-hmm. And you can't simply assume it's not important. He's saying, no, this is the way it is. Because this, where, is this, where is this paragraph found? In Shar HaGilguli. How many people learn Shar HaGilguli? How many people make the point of going into it? So most people aren't even aware of it. So it becomes the obligation of the people that do to share that information. Because there are people that do, you can't keep it to yourself. You have to, like, you know, people to be exposed to it. But again, you're also, you know, fighting against stereotypes and stigmas and things like that. But that's, he's putting it on the table, the, the idea itself. That makes a lot of sense, too, on a, on a national level, because you're saying that, the, that the, uh, if you don't learn these concepts, 
then you have to use the incarnate. Are you talking about, do you think when you talk about that, you're talking about on an individual level? But it's really also on a national level, because every generation, if doesn't the Calvary and Shiite, Another generation has, has to occur. Yeah, yeah. Has to occur, right? Yeah, yeah. So it becomes, you know, it just keeps perpetuating. Itself. Yeah, yeah. So well, where does the Shlos Esrei Mido fit into this uh, concept? Well, I mean, where does it fit into? Well, as we, we're talking about Druze, for instance, the yeah. Moran area. Well, these are tools. I mean, uh, how does where does this fit into the realm of uh, you know Pshat, Remez, Druze, and so on? How do we? How, you know, it's are there, it's are there, purely it's purely from so. The the Yud Gimel Midas Rachamim, uh-huh. right? As as no, Rashi points out, it's the same thing. The no, I'm talking. Oh, about you mean you mean the thirteen Midas that I wrote Yishmael? Exactly. Ah, those Midas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no. So that's 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 Drush. Uh-huh. He's I mean, the, the Drush is great, but they can be they can put out all different levels. That's that, and actually, there's actually more than that. There's more than thirteen. There's other who actually quote there's quite a few. Thirty-two more in yeah, uh, I think yeah. the back of yeah. uh, one of the in the back of uh, yeah. So that 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 basically is just a, a function of Drush. That's just that's, that's for the sake of those are the rules that we apply to Torah. Mm-hmm. You look at it, in fact, the art scroll has a very good explanation, an example right. of each one. Right. And, you know, they go through each one one by one, explain it. But basically, you, you see it, like the Gemara, Kalala put the in the okay, you know, right? You right now, is there a Shava, Kova Chomer? These are all these are all tools that the Gemara uses for darshing off psukim, you know, based on the of, of, of halach the church. Mm-hmm. It's a Messiah, it's a tradition. Mm-hmm. You, you, Moshe Bainer had to receive those rules. Like for example, Gezer Shava, right? Where you uh, the same word appears in two different places, two different contexts, but you can learn halacha into the other, right? So most Gezer Shavas basically are, are they're non halachas, they're a tradition. And that's like we know there's a connection there. And Rabbi Kiva or someone came along later on and just used that, that instrument. You, you cannot, as far as I know, you cannot be mechadish Gezer Shava. You can go ahead and say, yeah, I wonder if they're connected. Certainly, the ideas seem to be connected. But to say as as law as Torah Shabbat for the most part that had to be had to be Masar, that had to be tradition. So Moshe got these on. Moshe got this so from the first book. The, the, the whole the whole Harsuna experience uh-huh. was pure so. Uh-huh. That's what people don't realize. What is the point of so? Uh-huh. What what is it what does it do ultimately? Right. I mean the Nefesh Chaim brings down that anybody who does not know the sod of the mitzvah has no idea what the mitzvah is about. They're not really doing the mitzvah properly. You, know, you can't it's like it's like shooting at a target <laughs> with your with your your eyes blindfolded. You know, how, how accurately can you hit the target in the end? And tefillah is called, it's it's called an arrow, you're aiming. You're supposed to, it's like you're, you're trying to hit something with the tefillah or with your mitzvah that you're supposed to be doing. You can't just blindly do it. But the, the whole point of sod basically is that life, and this is very important, life is a game of hide and go seek. That's what it is. In the beginning, in Gan Eden, Akash Borch was so close he could talk to Adam face to face. He could find him the God. It was, that's how, how close the relationship was. When Adam did the chet, he hid. What is a hiding? I mean, did he think for one second he could hide from the Kodesh Baruch Hu? Did, did, did he drop in level so much that his understanding of how Shem works is even lower than ours today? Of course not. The hiding itself means he created barriers. The actual hiding means that he created mesachim, veils, barriers, right? So when you, when you learn pshat, you take away one barrier. One, one veil, right? Or maybe two, who knows, right? You learn mission, you go a little bit deeper, right? You're learning, you're learning uh, Drush, you're taking away more veils. Each one is being, is Megala Kosh Borchu more and more and more. So Sod goes one step further. And, and not to, it, it doesn't even go one step further. The, the leap from Pshat to Remus is the smallest of all. From Remus to Drush, it's a little bit bigger. From Drush to Sod is miles. It's huge. The Gilu, Hashchina, the Gilu of Kosh Borchu, my is that comes to sod is out, you know, overdoes everything else that came before it. The whole point of learning Torah is the sake of, of penetrating and pulling back the veils of creation to find the Shem, who said, now that you've hidden, right, the rest of history is for finding me. This is, these are very important, you know, Kabbalistic ideas that I brought down. That's what it says, the Kishboch of made for his for his glory, right? The Mekubim explained not for his, not that he's going to benefit, Meaning that the whole point of my sabrashis exists for the sake of revealing him. His name's revealed to him, the light that we draw down reveals him. That's the whole point of my of creation. You can't you can spend a whole couple of hours explaining what this point actually means and how that becomes a schar lamaba for how much you do that. Not only that, it's more than that, as it's as it's known, right, that these four levels of Pshat, Ramas, Drush, and Sud also correspond to the four levels of Neshama, Nefesh, Ruch, Neshama, and Ch- and Chayef. 
The Chida corresponds to Adam Kadmon, but we have no level of Torah learning for that because that's already a level way beyond anything we can, you know, at that level you're one with knowledge. Actually, before that, but even, even more so than you can possibly comprehend. But the, the basic idea is that the deeper you go to Torah, the deeper you go to your Neshama. Right? If you're only learning Chumash, you'll only penetrate the aspect of yourself called Nefesh, which means you barely know yourself at all. You want to know yourself more deeply, you start learning Mishnah. By learning, going deeper into Torah, you're also going deeper into your own Neshama, and therefore becoming more connected to it, and therefore becoming more one with yourself. Yeah. That's the ultimate, because at the end of it is a Kosh right? The, the whole point of becoming more connected to your neshama is to become a better, a, better, a better partner for Hashem, so to speak. Because it's the same way, like imagine, you know, two people meeting, you know, someone decides that one day he wants to marry the princess, and he's only a commoner right now, right? And uh, she's young, and he's the same age, basically, right? He can't do it right now, because on the level of a commoner, you know, she's the princess, it's not going to work. So what does he do? He goes to school, he learns, right? Literally becomes as much of a prince as he possibly can, as he, as he can become, based upon what's available to him. So likewise, you know, the same thing is true of, of us, that, you know, as on the level of nefesh, it's very hard to connect to God. Very hard. To feel him, to, to feel his reality, to see it, to relate to it, to, you know, to even like, you know, to have, you know, uh, any kind of like supernatural connection to him. But as you go deeper into Torah, more and more and more, your ability to perceive Hashem in creation increases, and because that increases, He can re- He can reveal Himself more and more to you as well, because you become a stronger kli to receive His light. Okay, but it's most, all about relationship. But most, maybe all of us, we've been here before, and and, and in order to you know, in order to get to that level of of so, you've had to have done the other levels, and if you didn't do them in your previous lifetimes. And now you're here, and if this is the last generation, and if this is the last generation of, of Gullah's first generation of uh, Gaula, it's going to get cut off, you'll never reach that level. Yeah. So, so, so how does that so, fit in? So first of all, as he says, based upon the person's ability, and their situation. But okay? most of us, most of us will never get to that level that the others are talking about. Not necessarily. First of all, you're still young. <laughs> you know what's coming up. As well, Shem, you know, many years, but but uh, also it says that uh, it, it, it says that before Mashiach comes, also Kesh is going to is going to just increase increase the amount of light flowing to my separations, and all of a sudden we'll be able to perceive things that uh, previous generations would have had, had to have worked a lot harder to receive those things. But this concept of Pshat and Adrushim Sod is not only that you go from the Chumash to the Mishnah to the Gemara to the you know, to the Zohar, yeah. right? It's also a process that you apply to everything. For example, if you're going to learn a pasuk, you're going to learn the chumash. You have to, you have to, you have to run through pshat and mizrush and sod, right? Which means, for example, as we'll see, there's, a, there's an example coming up shortly, but let's, let's wait till we get there. But uh, everybody in their own level, and you know, for example, you, you pick up uh, you pick up a sefer. But but the main thing is here's the main thing, and that is you have to be driven to have as deep an understanding of life and Torah and mitzvahs as you possibly can. You cannot be lazy, but and you cannot simply you know, rest on your, your present you know, existing state of, of learning, you have to know there's more, and you have to pursue them more as much as possible. And that's, that's a very important part of Hashgach HaPratis, because someone who does, Hashem opens doors, opens windows, opens opportunity. And I once, uh, I, I can speak personally as, as a personal example of this idea, because uh, you know, I, I, for, for many years I, I didn't even consider learning Zohar. I mean, I mean once everyone opens a Zohar once in a while, looks up a, 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 a shot or something, they understand some kind of reference, but it wasn't on my radar for the longest time. And then one day, you know, I was learning Madrashim, and I'm learning Madrashim, and I did a deeper and deeper understanding. And I felt I got to a point where, obviously, there was a lot more to learn, but I felt that there must be more, and I, and I wanted to know that more. And I just like, got this, this, this feeling intensified over time. And uh, just at the point, and I hadn't spoken it out with anybody at this point, but just at the point in my mind where I felt, you know, i, I got to somehow make an entry into that, that world, a neighbor of mine shows up with a safe of the lesson, the Shari lesson, and says, we need to learn this together. He literally walks, literally a day later, walks into my front door, and that was my, that was my first exposure. My first real exposure, my first real entry, you know, and you see, because Baruch he works it out. Somehow, if the person understands this is what has to happen, is making the effort to make it happen, then Baruch will find ways to, to feed it to you somehow. Okay, does it mean a person is a Seder in Zohar? Not necessarily. Right, you know, and, and more than likely not. But it means that the person will get the exposure to deeper ideas and see the sub behind the concept. He'll go to a shear 
He'll sit in a shir where somebody will give over information that will reveal the sod of a concept, of a mitzvah, of marriage, whatever the case may be. And it's all part of the picture. Who knows how much you can accumulate in one lifetime, but the main thing is to get on the, you know, in this process and not simply accept lower levels of understanding. Yeah, I think, I think what you're saying, Rob, is, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, um, by, by exposing yourself to it, you become receptive to greater possibilities. Exactly. And by doing that, when, you, you're, when people begin to talk, you no longer close down and the prejudice toward the words because you don't understand them, because had you not ever heard that this concept exists, that's the reaction you would have, right. typically, right? Right, right? But when you've been exposed to it now, you open up to it. Not, not only that, but as you listen to them, you will get new insights right. from what they're saying that you previously would never even have thought of because that's the direction you're moving. That's the next step. That, the, the, who, the ultimate chavrus is a Kosh Baruch. He's the ultimate chavrus. If, if you're willing to go with him, he will show you and expose you to things and, and give you a slacha that is not, it's not commensurate to what you're doing. And you know, you'll find that people who are, they're, they're, they're not, and not only that, by the way, I even found you know, a source that, that, you know, that, what does the Gemara mean? It says that even the air is machkim a person in Eretz Yisrael. Right? It, it, just the air itself is machkim a person, right? You know, so, you know, so, you just got wiser, you're not mm-hmm. breathing, you just got wiser all of a sudden. What does it mean? It means basically that it's a long story, but, but the basic idea is we know that the Or HaGenuz is what this is all about. The hidden light of creation with which what a Kosh made my separations. He hid it. The rest of life is about finding it. It's, this is the process. But how do, you, how do you reveal the light? This is the process, right? So as Rashi points out, because the Gemara says it, that on the first day of creation, the Kosh saw that Rishayim would abuse this light. So therefore he hid the light, and therefore it's, it's rightly called Or HaGenuz, the hidden light of, of creation. It's obviously not the light of the, of, of the sun, the moon, the stars, because they don't come out till day four. And incandescent lighting didn't come out until you know, three, four, five thousand years later. Right? So, and, and Rashaim used this light equally as we do. Right? You know, and the sun, the moon, the stars. So it's obviously a much more spiritual light. From Rashi, it sounds like it's a light that's reserved for, for Tzadikim, Lasid Lavo, Mini, Yemus, and Mashiach onward. But the Leshem explains, no, the hiding was not that. The hiding was not from everybody. The hiding was that Kosh built into this light a condition that your Midus will determine whether you can have access to this light or not. If you're a Tzaddik, the light will flow towards you. If a person's a Russian, God forbid, the light will repel them. They'll repel the light they had. So as a result of that, two people can look at the exact same thing. One person who's a Tzaddik will see it, and one person who's a Russian won't be able to see it. Right? So it's interesting. The Gemara calls people who live in Chutzlart of the Avodazor B'Tahara, a Tzaddik. A tzaddik who's living in Chutzlart is an omen of Buddha Zorba Tahar. What does it mean? It means that Tahara, he's a tzaddik. He's living by all the terms. He's not doing anything various per se. So why is it called Buddha Zorba? Because since he's forcing Kodesh Borchu to give him Shefa for his mitzvahs and his Torah in Chutzlart, the Shefa has to, by definition, flow through the angel of that place. That angel is on the side of Tuma automatically, spiritual impurity, because he's in Chutzlart. So therefore, it's like you're feeding the Avodah Zorah at the same time. So it's called Avodah Zorah Batar, right? So he, and, he has to, and, he, and he pays for that. Is, there's an onus for that. There's a Yisuri for that. Because you're, you're forcing it because Borchu's hand to have to have this you know, Shefa flow through this, this impure angel. However, in Yisrael, of course, it doesn't happen because of the fact that Mikhail is the Sarshal of, of Yisrael. He's totally Kadosh. And therefore, all the Shefa that flows back and forth in Israel is always through the hands of Kedusha. There's no such thing as you have in Chutzlart. What about the fact that a person only accesses the light if he's a tzaddik? Comes along the Ramak and says that anybody who lives in Israel, by definition, has a shame tzaddik to him. Mm-hmm. If they didn't, they'd be kicked out. Last week's Parsha, both Parshas, Achremos and Kedusha, end by talking about don't do this, right? That the people you came from, it's right. And the people are going to because the land spit them out, and you will be spit out as well. So therefore, the remarkings from this that and, and brings down you know, Raya's, that's what Moshe could there, right? That anybody who's living in Israel who's not been kicked out of the land by definition as a, as a Shem study, how is that possible? Even a feel becheses Russia, he says. Even if the person has a chazaka, people view this person as being a Russia, he's still living here? He hasn't been kicked out yet? He's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he has a status of being a tzaddik. 
So how's it possible? So he explains how the whole how the land is bechaper. I think you said last week. Remember last week you were saying that. Yeah, you read it inside. You read it inside, right? And even this week though, it's still a tough concept to, to, uh, to swallow. It's very hard concept uh, to swallow. But that's the Messiah. What, so so, living there, so, the, the so now, but but he was, but, he was oh, quoting he exactly. Was, he was quoting the Arizal. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. So so now yeah. I understand what the Gemara means by saying. And because this is a very, very fascinating Gemara. I mean, very fascinating. We have Gemara, right? Even the air is machim a person. Even the air makes a person wise. You know, if I always, you know, fall back on this example, but money talks, right? If someone's in the business of making money, and someone says you can make a lot of money over there, he doesn't say. That's all he says, right? What's the guy gonna do? Where? On the money over where? Right? If you're in the business of making money, that's what you're gonna think. You hear? That's the way you do it. The Jewish people are in the business of wisdom. We're in the business of chachma. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of being beit olam haba. Someone says, and, and it's, an, it's, a, it's an authority, because it's the Gemara, in Baba Basra. There's a Tanoim saying this. I'm like, and no one argues the point, and says, you can, you can get wisdom by breathing the air of various Israel. What is that supposed to mean? What does that mean? Literally? Like, rush there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I get off the airplane, I just stand there, you know, what if I go for one week and do nothing but, you know, you know, you know hyperventilate? You know, does that, that make me a tamal What does that mean? So, so you, have to, you have to go to the sod of the whole thing. And that's the bottom line. It all comes into sod because there's so much, there's so many important ideas. So now now you're, you're, giving a, you're giving me an idea because... See, I told you. <laughs> Today I was learning Rabbi Wine. I was looking at the Shira here. And uh, he was talking about uh, the period of time in the Middle Ages, uh, the church and the church march and then we were very strong. And we were kicked out of England. Okay, first time we were kicked out of England was around the uh, beginning of the 12th century, right. the early end of the 12th century. And we went there because business was supposed to be better than where we were because we were kicked out of France and other places. Okay, so when we went to England, it was supposed to be like the, the next stop. So when we got there, things turned around and they got bad. And ultimately we left. We had to leave. They kicked us out. They threw us out. And not only did they throw us out, we left with nothing. They wouldn't even let us take our books. That's why Oxford has all of the manuscripts. Mm. They confiscated the manuscripts. They have. They, they, they wouldn't even let us leave with our books. So what's Hashem saying? Listen. Go to the air where you can become a doctor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Who needs books? Who needs books? Right, right. But that's but so 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 what does what does the Gemara mean? The Gemara is telling you that basically that because of the fact that Eretz Israel, you know, by definition is machaper for you on an ongoing basis, therefore leashing the status of a tzaddik, it means you have ongoing access to the Oregon news by virtue of the fact you're in Eretz Israel, and people would, and that's what the Gemara says. Ain Torah, Ketor is Eretz Israel. Right? Because Eretz Israel is a special koyach that draws down. That's why we mentioned before the Ardain is Yerad Nun. Right? The Nun Shari Bina. The whole border is the Sulam. It's like, it's like one of... But again, it, this is all, it's all a function of Sod. Anyway, let's go to the Revitor. He says... He says... Well, right, when, when, what's, what are those? Nefesh Ruach Neshama? Is that right? Yeah, Nefesh Ruach Neshama and Chaya. And, and, and this corresponds to the to various the, levels, right? The shah, for the Rambus, four levels. Rosh, in, exactly. Rosh, in, 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 yeah, right? also the four worlds. Asiya, Yitzira, Bria... Uh -huh. It's all, they all correspond across the border, right? Uh, okay, so he said, that's what he says. The following is an example of a Torah-based, Torah ideal learned on all four levels of Pardes. The first verse of the Torah on a Peshat level traditionally understood to simply mean which means in the beginning God made the heaven and the earth. Classic, simple explanation. Nobody argues with that. You can change the wording, the pronunciation, but that's basically the way the Pasuk reads. However, as Rashi points out, the first word of the Torah in Hebrew, Rashi's, does not translate this way, alluding to a different level of meaning. That's Remus. Right? You know, Pshat is it's what you're, you see. It's out there in the open. It's, like, it's, it's available to everybody. It's what your, your first perception. Rem is, is like winking. Right? Winking is a physical thing. You can also see it, but the wink itself doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you that something is going on. You're talking amongst you know four or five people. One guy winks at another person. You have no idea what he means, but you know there's something going on because you can see it. But you can't unless you investigate. You're not going to know what it means. So the Torah is winking at us over here by using the word bereshis as opposed to the word birishon. That's what Rashi says. This verse is only meant for elucidation, as the rabbis teach. 
For the sake of Torah, which is called the beginning, Reishis, of, the, of his way, passing from Mishlei, and for the sake of the Jewish people, who are called the beginning, Reishis, of his increase, in Yemiyahu. God made the heaven and the earth. In other words, for the sake of Bereishis. We understood Bereishis as being one word. It turns out that Bereishis can't be the word here, because if you want to say the beginning of something, using the proper language, you would say, Bereishona. Bereishona bora elokim esa shemaim esa aris. But to say Bereishis means it doesn't fit, it doesn't, it's not the, the, the construct. So therefore, then what could, then what, the tar can't be wrong. You know, and I, I know what it means to, to have editors and still make mistakes in your books, but God had no editors because God's perfect. And he writes the Sefer Torah, it's perfect. Moshe did it letter by letter, word by word, it's perfect. They didn't, and certainly the first word, no author makes a mistake in the first word of his book. You know, that, that's more than, you know. So, so what's Bereshis? So Rashi says, Bereshis is two words. Bereshis. That works. Bo for the sake of Reishis. What's Reishis? We bring them Psukim. One Reishis refers to Torah itself. One Reishis refers to the Jewish people. <clears throat> and the verse Pasuk is telling you that for the sake of Torah and for the sake of the Jewish people, God made heaven and the earth. What's the word Reishis mean? First? It means first. First. Yeah. Reishis, reishis Goyim. I'm like, is a Reishis Goyim, right? Okay. Reishis means first. So, Bo Reishis uh-huh. is the proper pronunciation. For the, uh, proper, like, that's the proper word for the Pshat I'll be here. This so concept is true. For the sake of the first. Yeah, that's for the sake of the first, and we explain what the first is based on the psukim. So that's just that the text is not intended to point out the order of creation as most people think. For if it intended to teach this, it would have written the word barishona. That means the beginning of something. Since the word resh in, in the Torah is in the construct state, which we follow by the word, another word to, to explain what it's talking about normally. So therefore, we know this concept is true because we saw, or we see, in the Gemara in Shabbos on uh, Pei Ches Amud Aleph, in the famous Gemara, over there, where, where, the, where the Gemara asks the question, every day of Maisa Bereshis, it says, you know, the er Hivoker Yom Echad, er Hivoker Yom Sheni. All of a sudden, by day six, it adds a He, right? The er Hivoker Yom Hashishi. So the Gemara says, what's the He? The Gemara says, the He refers to Chamishi Chum Sheitara, and the Shishi is referring to the sixth of Siva. So why is it over here? What's the remnant? Why is this allude to over here and that Pasuk? Because the Kodesh Baruch Hu made it tonight with my separations. If the Jewish people will accept the Torah on the 6th of Sivan, 2,448 years from now, right? Then the, world, the world has permission to go weiter, to go on. But if not, I hereby command the world to go back to Toba Bohu. So we see from that Gemara and from that Pasuk that the world stands on the Torah and the Jewish people accepting Torah. So therefore, Bereshis, in a sense, is a warning. And it's also Pshat, telling us, for the sake of Torah and for the sake of the Jewish people, God made creation. If they don't exist, the whole world has no justification to exist. That's the remnant of that, that, that one word. Bereshis, on a Pshat level, means in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. And Bereshis, on a remnant level, means for the sake of Reishis, God made the heaven and the earth. So, so when you're saying... For the sake of Reishis, you know? Mm-hmm. Boy, the, so all we're seeing is for the sake of the, for the sake of something, right? Yeah. The boom means for the sake of? For the sake, for the sake of. Yeah. What, 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 what is left out is what it is the sake for. So we're now filling in the blanks and saying it's for the sake of the Jewish people. Right. And also for the sake of what? Tar. Tar. What's the proof of that? How do you know that? What's the proof that those words mean now? No, what's the proof that Reishi means for the sake of the Jewish people and the sake of Torah? Well, yeah, that's why he brings, he, brings he brings the psukim down. The one passage from, from Yemiyahu. Well, the, con- the concept existed before. Now, this is not a chiddush. We know this already. Just like I brought the Gemara right, down Shabbat. Like proof? all of Torah Shabbat Pad, we know these concepts to be true. They, we, they, these are things that God taught the Moshe Benu conceptually. We know it's a historical fact. That, that that's the way it works, basically. So, so all we're doing, basically, is we're putting clothing on the idea. We're going back and we're finding sources in the Torah, finding this that we know to be true. So, and, and Rashi's backing himself up by bringing psukim to show that we, in fact, are called Rashi's. And because, uh, you know, Amalek's also called Rashi's. Maybe he's also, you know. So, so essentially, what, I see what you're saying. So, was answering, uh, answering Steve also. So, Bill Remnitz, if you're saying, if you're saying now that, that the hay is for the indication of the Torah, right? And the shish, hashishi is on the sixth day of Sivan, right. right? So there, how did 
only Hashem would know that in the future we would receive the Torah. Right. So otherwise, he would have destroyed the world right there and then. Right. Okay. Okay. Fine. All right. okay. Yeah. So now, when we're using Yeshiyahu to come back and explain Rashi's, it makes sense mm-hmm. because he sees the he sees the process from his position going backward. Right. Hashem sees it. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You know what I'm trying to say, Steve? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we can use, ordinarily, we wouldn't, how can, how, how are we now, because most people would object using Navi to explain a very important word in the Torah, especially the first word in the Torah, say, Rashis. Right. All right? It's like the Gomorrah. You're not going to use the Gomorrah. What do you, you know, and you can explain the Gomorrah concept. If you don't have a Pusik in the Torah, and now you have to go fishing into the Navi for it, you start to say, Oh wait a minute! It may, oh, what kind of a proof is this? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But the fact that we know that God, you know, is not telling us emphatically what He's talking about, but we do know that He would have destroyed the world, right? But it's still in existence. Must be that He's going to re- let us rely on the Navi to explain why He is that He, you know, He didn't destroy it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So hence the usage of the Hebrew word I mean, Barishis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hence, the use of the word, the Hebrew word Bereshis, instead of Bereshona, hints, Remez, to a different layer of meaning for the first verse. Rather than translate Bereshis as in the beginning, as is traditionally done, it is understood to mean, for the sake of Reshis, God made the heaven and the earth, Reshis referring to both the Torah and the Jewish people. That's, that's those two levels so far. Is that Remez? That Remez? That's, that's Remez. remez. That's it's remez. all Remez, yeah. Drush. From the word Lidrosh, to investigate, is trickier because it is, it is not usually as obvious as the level of Remez and often requires a tradition. In this case, like with respect to Remez, the focus is, on the, is, is, is the first word of the Torah, Bereshis, except that it is understood differently. So this is where the Sosesh Remigre would come in. Um, that would have to be given by God. In other words, that's a, that yeah, a, but those are those are different tools that for connecting different. So we're, we're dealing right here with one word only, oh. with one word, you know, and, that, and just understanding it on the four levels. We have midrashim to explain these things. We have sources for these ideas. So you know, those 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 midos are basically you know you can apply it here also. But those midos for the for the most part, for the sake of of of, of using the verses to. Well, I think the Mephorshim go into it and they talk about it. In, in, in Rashi brings down, uh, he talks about where racious occurs everywhere in the Torah. That's what he talks about. He talks about it like, like in Purim and here and yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So, so that must be like uh, showing... Yeah, but Rashi, see, what, what's going on over here? Uh, it's going, this, is, this is a very important person also to bring out, that, that you know, when you learn Gemara, the Gemara example you know, asks the question that uh, how do you know that a married woman has to cover her hair? Right, so the Gemara brings up the whole in Salta. Right, the, the the adulteress, you know, you know, who uh, who gets caught and, and she has to go to the base of Mikdash and it says in the Torah that they uncover her hair, right? And from this we learn out that a married woman covers her hair. So anybody who's not yet you know well seasoned in Gemara tradition would ask the question, how is that a proof? From that one little proof you're gonna make all married women through all history cover their hair, maybe they put it on her head because she first walked in. Maybe she forgot to wash her hair. She wanted to cover her hair before she got there. You know, who knows? It could be a, a dozen reasons why her hair was covered and why this is part of the process to uncover her hair. You also see that. Why don't we use it by, uh, in, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, the wife of Joseph uh, from the tribe of Shimon, who sat in front of the door. Who was that? Yeah. And, uh, on the pellet. <coughs> she was like, sitting in front of the door with her hair on Yeah, but that's a medrash. That that, that's, well, that's, that's a medrash. That's, that's not a pasuk. Not a pasuk. You know, so so the question is like, you know, how, you know is, aren't you really reaching into? It doesn't say the Torah. You know, it says how, she wore to fill. She wore to fill. It's black and white. You know, and also it's filled black and white. You know, you got to put them on where, right? But but this is like you know really stretching and reaching because this is a, if it just said and the married woman who was covered, you know, who had her hair covered as a married woman, you know, you know, took off her hair covering. That's one thing. But here it says that she's a sota, unusual circumstance. The whole halakha is kind of cloudy. How can you make that the basis of such an important halakha that's going to affect women for who knows how many thousands of years? In this, you know? So the answer is because we, we're not asking what's the source of this halakha. If that was the case, that would be a good question. We know already married women cover their hair. How do we know that? Because it's a Masorah. From, uh, a part of the Torah Shabbat prayer that Moshe got from Harsinai that a married woman's hair is called an Arab and therefore she has to cover her hair. 
There's like a, a call is also called an erva. We know this from Tor Peh. The Gemara is asking the question, but I know all of Tor Peh is somewhere inside Tor Shuk Right? I know that. And the, and the Gemara is concerned primarily with marrying the two together. We want to make them one. Right? How do you know that a woman can be acquired using Kesar Shtarabiyah? From a field. <laughs> that, that doesn't go over too well with a lot of women, basically. You know, how, you know that's how you're going to learn the halacha about marriage over here. No, we know that money, kesed kedushin is used, and these other, these other devices are used to make marriage. We're now looking for a, a written, a pasach, something in the Torah that will tell us that. There's times it's obvious. The pasach itself says exactly that thing. And there's times it can't be so obvious because the Torah, you know, is, is mesuyam. It's a certain amount of letters, and, you know, for the, the souls of Kali Israel. Kishboch who wrote in such a way that it's not like this, you know, if the Torah, Torah Shusav had all of Torah Shubal it, you know, the, the entire Shulchan Aruch and the Gemara, basically, nobody could do Hagba by themselves. Okay? It would basically be massive. That's not, that, that's not the reason why Kishboch who kept it separate. They'd not be, you know, to make it practical. They'd always make it stronger people, too. You know, like Hagba could be six people at one time, as opposed to, it was, you know, share the Kibbutz much easier. But, uh, but, you know, that's, I mean, that's just a, a, a practical, you know, Reality and representation, but we know that that the halacha is that she has to cover her hair. Now we're saying, what's where in the Torah could there be a source for that idea? So now the most obvious one is the Sota. See, if you're looking for the source, it's not so obvious from Sota. If you're looking just for a connect, for <coughs> a basis for the, this halacha, the most obvious one is the Sota. All of a sudden, that's the difference. So everything we're stating, medrash, you know, everything basically is part of Torah Shabbat Peh. It's, it's an idea that was given to Moshe Ben Harsina that he passed down. If I'm going to be mechadish something, I cannot be megalik parim b'torah. I cannot make new ideas that Moshe did not get. What I can do is find new applications, I can find new expressions of it, and I can use old ideas to explain new realities. Right? That, that's all mutter. That's all part of my makam b'torah in the end. But the idea itself has to go back to Moshe Ben Harsina. This is the the fundamental problem that people have, you know, in the conservative and reform movement, they don't understand this is not what it's not what's going on. What they think is that the rabbis didn't make this up. This has to go back to Har Sinai. What the rabbis did was they said, okay, now knowing the halacha is part of our tradition, your law, where can we you know, trace it back? So likewise, what Rashi is doing over here, he's not making this up. We know this. This you don't you don't need Yeshaya, you don't need Mishlei, you don't know any of that stuff. We just know that's true. This is the way it is. And the fact that the, the Torah is worded this way. You know, it gives us the opening to make this point. And to reinforce it, Rashi comes along and brings Psuki. So you don't need anything else beyond that. Because, because the bottom line is, is that both the, the, the Tartan written law and the oral law were given by Kosh Baruch to the Jewish people of Harsina. So you're saying we know it strictly because of Masorah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. That's the basis of all of our knowledge. And we don't know it's Masorah, we have question marks beside. So for example, in the Mishnah, Rabbi Yudha Nasi compiled the Mishnah where there's no machlokis, it's written clearly as a halacha. Where there is a machlokis, he left it as a machlokis. He put the machlokis in the mission so we would know this is unclear to us. The beauty of, of it is that basically is that, you know, not beauty, but the, the practical application is how do you supposed to function? So he's saying there's two opinions. One opinion is more makpid, or more mach, or even, right? More makpid is, is, is more accurate, right? So therefore, why not try and go like him? Because since there is somebody who says that, Let's go by the one, you know, because that way that, that we see all opinions, right? But since there are extenuating circumstances where maybe we can't always go like him, it's good to know that somebody else says more leniently instead. And that's what the Kedolim are, are passing by very often situations. It's because there is a Mandamar in the Gemara, but without that Mandamar, without someone in the Gemara, without the tradition, without that Safik, if there's no, no such opinion, we can't make it up on our own. But when they're arguing in the Gemara, it's more than that. That uh, Rabbi Yehuda says no, this is the Masora, and Rav uh, Abayah says exactly no, this, what they are always, doing. They're always, always doing without that. exception. They just don't word it that way. The authority in any Mishnah or Gemara is how far you can trace that. Hal- when Rabbi Yehuda Nasi pulled together everybody to make the Mishnah, they sat there and they said, "What did you hear?" They said, "I heard the halach like that." Where'd you get it from? I got it from him. Where'd he get it from? He got it from him. Where'd he get it from? The, whoever could trace it back the furthest, that was the halacha. Okay. When a, per, a person's expressing an opinion, it will, and that's why, for example, the Gemara will often break down. I don't want to spend too much time in this discussion. Obviously, you, can, you know, it's a uh, you know, to itself. But the Gemara, you know, will, will say, you know, you'll hear this, uh, this rub express, Elizabeth Gemara will express his opinion over and over again. 
And he seems like, you know, it's his opinion. And then you find that later on, he never said anything, he never heard from his Rebbe. And Rashi, Rashi also, right? Rashi will, will, will talk and talk and talk and say, that's Rashi talking, it's Rashi talking. And then once in a while, Rashi will say, I'm not sure, I didn't hear this from my Rebbe. And you realize now, all the time, he was quoting his Rebbe, what he learned from somebody else before. And when he didn't, he makes the point of speaking it out in the end. This is, this is hugely important in understanding this whole process because we're not making it up. What we're doing basically is we're using, we're using Pardes to understand more deeply what we've always inherited, right? And what we lost, we lost, and that's the way to Mashiach to bring it back. The Arizal, you know, Baruch Hashem, we wouldn't have nearly the Kabbalah we have today if it wasn't for the fact that the Arizal came along later on. And of course, Baruch Hu sent Eliyahu Navi, whoever, Moshe Benu, you know, you know, to teach him. And he was able to get the Ruch HaKadosh and recover things that had been lost to us or never even revealed in the first place. Because, because unlike Torah Shabbat Peh, the, the, the Nigla part, the revealed part, which gets weaker with every you know, successive generation, uh, Torah Nistar seems to get stronger. And one of the reasons why, I mean, there's a historical reason why as well, which we will get to later on this version, but one of the reasons why is because Torah Shabbat Peh, basically the straightforward halacha, requires a tradition. People forget. There's been persecution, assimilation, intermarriage, all these things interfere with the tradition. But Nistar requires, it requires understanding to survive, basically. And the physical world has become very, very Kabbalistic. How so? Look at technology today. If, if, if you took a person from 100 years ago and you, and you put him today, you showed him a, a cell phone, right? And, you know, a, 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 or, or anything, you know, any like light bulbs, you know, we have today, he thinks that you're a sorcerer. You think that you're a magician. How could you possibly do this? Everybody today is a sorcerer and a magician. They all have it so easily because he's coming from a time they didn't have it. So what happens is that technology became very magical because the more we understood the physical world, the more we're able to understand you know, how it works and apply it. But the physical world is a mirror of the spiritual world. So by the, all this, techno, this, this technological understanding has been helping us to come up with, with, with uh, examples and parables to better understand the Kabbalistic world. It's much easier today. A long time ago, when the Rizal spoke about certain ideas, he had nothing to point and say, it's like that. Now, you, you either understood the idea, and you're blessed to understand, or you didn't, because it was abstract. But today, you want to enter the, enter the spheres? I can, use, I can use an analogy of a power plant and transformers, and use that as a way to explain one of the, most, the deepest, most Kabbalistic concepts there are. Because if the Shboruch has allowed that, the physical world to become a better representation, and, and revealer of the spiritual world. Let's just try and finish the, uh, the introduction today. Anyway. <laughs> okay. On the level of Drush, Bereshis is divided into two words, Bara, which means he created, and Shis, which is Aramaic for the word six. People ask, you know, the Gemara brings down Megillah, examples of Aramaic words in the Torah itself. Obviously, you know, it's, it's not, the word doesn't stand alone. It's part of the word Bereshis. But, you know, what does Shis mean? So it means six Aramaic. As in the, day, the six days of creation, Hence, the Zohar is explaining... Why, is Why does it have to be uh, Aramaic? That's what it is. Sheesh is six. Yeah, but it's written shish. Right. Sh sh it's written, that's how you write you six in Aramaic, is shin, yud, taf. It doesn't say shin, shin, shin. Right? That's, I mean, you have to change the whole word for that. Mm -hmm. So in order to build it in, uh, you, have to ha you, have use, you have to use the Aramaic word. So there's a few places the Gemara brings down in Megillah where Kush Baruch used Aramaic words. In the Torah. So obviously Aramaic has some kind of significance because Babel, you know, the Gemara is, is, is in Aramaic. Kaddish is in Aramaic. It, it has some role. It says that the, the Malachi Sharis don't understand Aramaic. A little bit of a problem. Some do, some don't. But uh, that's, that's, that's what the Medrash is saying. Mm -hmm. So it says, uh, hence the Zohar is explaining, when God pronounced the word Bereshis, he brought into being all the six days of creation as Rashi explains. All aspects of heaven and earth were created on the first day, but each was not put into place until the day on which it was actually commanded. So we see from Rashi and the Ramban as well that, that everything, the Kishboruch said the word Bereshis, it's hard to comprehend, but in that one word was the potential for all six days of creation that was, gonna, was going to exist. It, all, it was all created. On a and, physical level. On a physical level. Uh, was physical level as physical as physical as back then, okay. right? But definitely as a messiah, not a concept, not a conceptual level, right? In other words, for example, even though the sun, the moon, and the stars were not commanded into their places until the fourth day of creation, they came into existence on the first day of creation, like all other aspects of heaven and earth. 
and not just the first days, of, the first six days of creation, apparently, but even all six thousand years destined to follow. This is what Bereshit teaches on the level of Drush, making history far from random, because it's all built in. History is not simply evolving. That you know, what's, this next moment wasn't created until now, right? And therefore, it just happened to be the result of what happened before it. But rather, every single second of history from the beginning was already created. You, me, the whole world was all done at the beginning. And now, just like the same way the sun, the moon, the stars came on the fourth day, and the trees on the on the third day, and the water, you know, that's what's happening historically. Whatever was created back then is now, you know, is, is like a time capsule. That, that gets very problematical. Yeah. Because uh, now you're talking about the entire, the entire world was created from tohu vavohu until the most of Shia. That take a look at the world around you. Do you have any doubt about that? Huh? So take a look at the world around you. Do you have any doubt about that? Uh, well, uh, do I? Well, in ter- I, I don't have a doubt. I, I listen conceptually. I can understand it, but think about it. Where, how does free will fit into that? Okay, because essentially there are there, there are don't don't go there now. <laughs> don't go there now. Well, we can we can discuss that aside, but that's that uh-huh. it, it fits in perfectly. There's no I mean this the, the, what you're talking well, I about. I can now. see how the Kodesh Borchu being that Kodesh Borchu would have created so many decision trees that if if, if it. If you decided to do this, it would go this way. Yeah, just to, 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 as a simpler, you know, just to put it in perspective, you have to understand that all the events, you know, and, and people that will, will ever exist, were created at the beginning. But who's going to be the per, like the person personally who will do this particular act? That becomes you know a function of free will. It's a, it's a it's a very it's a very important discussion for another time. But but uh, it'll, it'll sidetrack the whole thing. Okay, so he says that's uh, the concept. Everything the Kodesh Borchu. At the beginning, he, he created the whole Gans of Geshechta from the very beginning. That's what Bereshis means uh-huh. on a Jewish level. Uh-huh. That's what Bereshis is and, telling you. And essentially, what happens is that he lifted the veil on the moment that it was supposed to come into existence. So he lifted the veil. He put it in place. Whatever that. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. But uh, he he organized. Whatever metaphor you want to use. In other words, you know, it's like being on stage. You know, like you gotta you got the next act. You know, so the next act, the curtain goes up. Right. Right. So. The sun, moon, and stars appear. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And a six-day right. man appears. It was a six-act play. I got you. Okay. Sod, which means secret, like Drush, requires a tradition to give its credibility. To give it credibility. Indeed, without tradition, the following, the following about the word Barashis could not be known. So, again, Barashis, right? Over them, the spheres of Chesed, Vortiferes, Netzechod, Yesod, was a sphere of Bina, which created the, the six extremities of Chesed through Yesod. Going to be a grow. That's obviously we're we're going to run with Kabbalah at this point in time. But what does Barashis mean? Barashis means he, he made not just the six days on the first day when he said Barashis, not just the six millennia that will come from it, right? But really the six spheres. This is the beginning of the six spheres. There are ten spheres in all of existence. Kesser Chak Mabina Chesed Gevur Tiferes Natsachod Yosod Malchus. They govern all of existence from 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 the beginning until even into into Olam Haba. The six spheres of Chesed through Yesod are the, the cosmic DNA of our reality, basically. And in order to make the six days of creation, you have to first make this cosmic DNA. So Kabbalah says that, that the Barashis is actually an indication that that's when the spheres of Chesed through Yesod actually came into existence. And because they came into existence, you can now have the six days of creation which depend upon them for their existence. That's what Barashis means. Ah, so, so, so the six then... So that when he created the six days, right? That's really the the, the spheres are are analogous to the six days. They are the, they are the the root of them. Uh-huh. The, the potential for the first day is in the sphere of Chesed. That's why it's the day of light, and the, and Gvura is the basis for the second day. What happens on the second day? The water is divided. Dividing something is a function of Gvur. You're giving it borders and limitations, right? The third day is Tiferes. So you're getting the you're getting the the, uh, the trees and all, the world starts to form, it looks more, more beautiful, more balanced. And so each day is based upon, is based upon the, the koich of the sphera, that's the root of it. The same way, for example, you are the physical fulfillment of your, your, your DNA. Your DNA has all the information encoded, you know, at what, you know, how tall you're going to be, what color your hair is going to be, the teeth, the whole, it's all encoded. So the rest of your life is based on just acting out of what's already been encoded in your DNA. So likewise, each day was just like the sprouting of the potential that was in the sphera that corresponds to it. 
And that was made on the first day when Kosh Baruch said, Barashis, Barashis, the six spheres, right? A little diagram over here, the six spheres. So much of Kabbalah is concerned with understanding the concept of a sphere, of which there are, there are in general ten. They depict different traits within existence, but they are completely spiritual on the basis of all that exists, spiritually and physically. They are the system that God created to receive his infinite light in order to constrict and filter it, eventually resulting in creation, man, and free will. In other words, How Moshe... How free will fit in here? Moshe... <laughs> you put it there, Rob. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah. How does that fit into the spirit? I'll show you. <laughs> right? Mo- Mo- Moshe asked the Kush Baruch Hu, yeah. show me your face. And God says to Moshe Bedu, no man can see my face and live. What does it mean? Mo- what's, what, what does it mean to see a person's face? So Kabbalah explains because the face basically is the most direct you know, expression of a person. It shows the inside. So Moshe is saying to God, show me, I don't want to see the back of your head. I don't want to see you know, your head. I want to see you know, what you're thinking. I want to see what you're all about. I want to understand you on a, on a much higher level. So God says to Moshe, on the level you're asking me about, your body couldn't handle that light not possible, right? So we learn from this that God's light at its most intense levels, creation can exist. You know, when, there, when there's a miracle, free will disappears because it becomes so obvious that God's doing it that how can you choose not to believe in God? I create some, you create the there's no denial, there's no like, you know, maybe the planets are lining up and it's like, no, it's obvious. So then we can ask the question how it happened and come up with theories like that because we're not experiencing Kriya Yamsu. It wasn't just simply a question of seeing it. It's also experiencing it. There's an atmosphere involved, and, and your, your whole body knows this is God doing it, right? So in order to have free will, you have to have Hester Pani. You have to have God able to do things in a way that can delude you to thinking there's a thing called nature in the head. You can't have Hester Pani if God's light is as, in, as intense as it is as the source. So how do you get Hester Pani? By having a system that filters the light down. So the spheres make possible physical creation. How do you get this table in a, in a reality where God is, is totally spiritual? That's called simsum, right? The light is being filtered, it's being constricted. How do you get man, right? And different types of men, you know, different faces. No one looks the same because it's simsum, right? How do you get free will? Because it's simsum. It's all about filtering the light. So the spheres are the basis of, all the, of the whole system that God created for the sake of man to exist in a world that has all the reality that you experience. The same time, making possible free will, so you can earn your reward in the world to come. Does free will only exist in the sphere in which we're in? Uh, no, no. Funny you should ask that question. I just saw. I would have thought yes, but I saw something last Friday that says no. It starts higher up. Really? It not starts with, higher up. Well, not with yeah. the angels. How does that happen? Uh, not with the angels. No. How does but that our, happen? Because the neshama comes from a higher higher level. Yeah. And contrary to popular thought, what I once previously thought. That apparently the the, the of, of free will is not just because the body and soul come together, but it's actually rooted in the soul itself because of where it comes from. That's assured to itself. We can see the inside at another point in time, but it's not right. It's not from now. Make more uh, my reason because uh, yeah. Ari Zoff said all the Jewish souls were inside. It was even before my separations. Even before my separations. Therefore, in order for creation to exist, the spheres had to first exist. And so it reveals that when God said Bereshis, he brought into existence the six spheres that are the basis of our six millennia, Chesed Riyasod. The previous ones, Keser Chachman Bina, which are the basis of the eternal reality of Aloma Ba, the world to come, had already been created. One word, four different layers of explanation, each one more profound than the previous, and each one with important implications about life and history. However, Pshat not only refers to a level of understanding, it also refers to a level of Torah learning. For example, the verse of the Torah, which is commonly called Torah Shemesav, the written Torah can be read as they are written. They are the level of Pshat. The concise teachings of the Torah, Torah Shabal Pet, the oral law, or the Mishnah, correspond to the level of Remus, because they are only alluded to in the written Torah and hint to other levels of understanding. Drush, being the level of investigation, therefore corresponds to, Talmud, to the Talmudic teachings, since they are the result of investigating the meaning of the Mishnayis and other aspects of, of the oral tradition, sort of course, it corresponds to Kabbalah. So, when learning Mikra, another name for a verse in the written Torah, it does not take much to make a person realize that, that an oral tradition must exist 
that more fully explains the meaning of the verse. This is especially so when it comes to actual laws, which most of the time cannot be understood by the information supplied by the written law. The Torah tells you the word to fill in. What does fill look like? The Torah tells you to shef an animal. Hayedu shechita. Right? Clearly the Torah itself has to have something else to explain it. Anybody who, who negates the oral law but still learns Torah only replaces it. You can't negate the reality of the oral law because nobody but nobody can live by Torah without some kind of interpretation of what's actually being said. The only difference is going to be what's the source of that interpretation. Right? So he says, uh, he, say he says, but you know, the same is true when learning Mishnayis which were constructed in a way to, as to prompt discussion and encourage further and deeper investigation. The Talmud, which does exactly this, is massive, yet it itself is only a brief recording of the many discussions that have taken place over the ages to make sense of the oral teachings so that it can be applied in everyday life and become halacha. Therefore, many great minds and leaders over the ages have written explanations of the Talmud and responsa to legal issues of their times in order to speak out was implied by the Talmud, but not necessarily recorded there. This especially became necessary as the exile of the Jewish people deepened, religious persecution intensified, and assimilation became rampant. Became rampant. People don't, you know, a very important part of understanding the Masora is also understanding the Jewish history. Another problem, because a lot of people don't take the time to do that. We think, you know, it's just basically passed on you know, from generation to generation, but the reality is it was once a time that the Jewish people were totally centralized, came the Romans, and they began to disperse to different parts of, of, of Europe and, and Asia, and in the beginning, it's not like it was today. Today, you move into a Jewish community, everybody has a rub. There's a lace, you know, rub every 50 centimeters, you find another rub, and a higher rub, another, another, another rub. But in, in the beginning, it was basically the other way around, that people were dispersed to different locales in different parts of the Roman Empire, where there was no leadership whatsoever. You had people who wanted to still live by Torah mitzvahs that had no leadership. That forced people to write and send messengers and to travel far away to find the Rav, or the Rav would travel as well to come to them in order to instruct them and, and answer all the questions. They would come once a week, twice a week, once a month, once a year, and answer all the questions. And that forced the issue of having to write down responses and, and collectively make bodies of knowledge that the Jews could draw on. The Rambam, when he wrote the Mishnah Torah, which he said will, 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 will end the necessity for all other Sforim, basically, was writing for the Jews of the Diaspora. Because he said, you know, people, they, they can't learn Gemara. They, have, they don't have a Gemara, first of all, if it's even available. But even if it's available, it's not necessarily accurate, and, and who can even learn it? So therefore, the Rambam, for 10 years, sat down with the entire Gemara, Pashkin, all the Shilas, based upon whatever Machlok, because whatever was clear was clear, where there was a machlokas, he paskin, and this was meant to be the shochan aruch of his time. Just like we were shochan aruch as well, in our time, in Mishnah Brewer, and all the responses to that. In the end, it spawned, you know, he was, he was so makat to his words, he was so, was so brief, that no safer has spawned more svarim than the Mishnah Torah, mm-hmm. in the index of the Torah itself. Right? And uh, to this very day, you know, people keep adding on, explaining more and more. But uh, that's, that's all part of the historic reality of the Masora. So to preserve the integrity of Jewish law over the millennia, more and more of the oral law had to be written down, eventually developing into what has probably been called the Sea of Talmud. However, to what end? What in essence is Torah? Torah comes from a word that means teach. However, as the Talmud explains, it is not first and foremost a history book, and it will often sacrifice chronological accuracy to make a philosophical or legal point. But as Rashi explains, it is not only a legal book either. Right? Otherwise, it could have begun with the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people and not an account of Maisa Bereshis. Right? As Rashi points out at the beginning, the Torah should have begun with Zerach The first mitzvah given to the Jewish people was Kisha Chodesh. If it was meant to be only a Shochan Aruch, only a book of, of law, it should have begun with the law. So he says... Uh, um, The Medjish provides an important clue for understanding what Torah should, should mean to us. What, what are you trying to say here? I'm, I'm, what, what are you trying to say here? We're trying to isolate what Torah actually is. Uh, yeah. uh, we haven't done that yet. Mm-hmm. All, we, all we did so far was prove that it's not only a history book, but it's not only a, a legal book. Right. So then what is it? Uh-huh. So the Medjish provides an important clue for understanding what Torah should mean to us. When God decided to make creation, he looked into the Torah as if it were a blueprint. 
If so, then why give the Torah to us? Why give the blueprint for creation to man? Something which apparently, as the Talmud teaches, the angels argued against. It says in the Gemara in Shabbos, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi has also said, When Moshe ascended on high, the ministering angels said before the Holy Blessed is he, Master of the universe, what business has one born of women amongst us? He's come to receive the talk. He answered, uh, he answered he to them. They said to him, that secret treasure which has been hidden by you for 974 generations before the world was created, you want to give to flesh and blood? What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? O Lord, our God, how mighty is your name in all the earth. Who has set your glory, the Torah, upon the heavens? So from that, the angels argued. Right? Moshe came back with an answer in the end. Right? But the reality is that on a sod level, Moshe's answer also creates more questions. The question is still why the Torah is given to us if it's simply the blueprint of creation. However, the point was only to create good soldiers, that is, of doing the mitzvahs to the best of our ability and thereby earning reward in the world to come, a streamlined version of the Torah would have sufficed. If it was only a question of getting pshat, of only understanding the intricacies of everyday halacha, so that we can become b'nei olam abba, people destined to go to the world to come, then the Rambam's Mishnah Torah or something like it would have been enough. And if it is enough, then why do we continue to suffer as a nation in spite of our best efforts to increase our fulfillment of the mitzvahs and expand our learning of the Talmud? In fact, why is it that, in spite of our level of genius and vast knowledge of Torah, we seem to underestimate the seriousness of historical events and often fall prey to our enemies at the end of each exile? Could it be that we are drowning in shots.